It's been a year of consolidation and growth for the Indian Air Force. It's also been an opportunity to look at emerging challenges around the world. The nature of warfare itself, some would suggest, is changing a fair bit. Uh, just ahead of Republic Day, who better to speak to than the Chief of Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Chaudhary. Thank you, sir, very much uh, for being with us. Sir, Atma Nirbhatta, of course, is the premise of the Indian Armed Forces now. The Tejas platform is uh, an essential part of that. You have been associated with the Tejas platform for many, many years. What was it when you were working on the Tejas and what is it now? See, the uh, spiral development program of the Tejas has really had caught steam after mm -hmm. the uh, induction of the FOC version of the Tejas a few years ago. And you are aware that we now have two squadrons which are fully operational on this platform. We also had uh, signed a contract for 83 additional LCAs and now we've got the AON for 97 more. Right. So our fleet uh, in the Indian Air Force will have more than 220 LCAs. Yeah. That only shows the confidence that we're placing on this very potent small platform. And you've seen the platform uh, from an initial stage. What was that experience and when you fly it now? Uh, like could you just for the benefit of our viewers tell us how it's evolved over a period of time? Like I said, it is a development project which really caught steam with, uh, with the addition of some new technologies. The newer versions now will have the ASA radar, they will have better sense of fusion, they will have better weapon systems, a better electronic warfare system. So all this is, uh, the growth potential is tremendous. And uh, it, it takes place in, uh, in small increments at a time. But sometimes there is a huge leap in technology, particularly now with the Uttam radar coming on on the next tranche of the yeah. uh, LCAs. Yeah. Uh, and sir, uh, in terms of uh, meeting our squadron requirements, we are below our squadron requirements right now, whatever is mandated or authorized to the IAF, how important is the Tejas platform? It's definitely very important because the Tejas was originally designed to replace the mm -hmm. MiG-21 and the MiG-23-27 class of aircraft. And now with the winding down of the MiG-21 squadrons in the coming year or two, these uh, are very essential to fill the numbers that are essential to maintain the um, security and safety of the nation. And therefore, sir, are you satisfied at the pace at which we are building the Tejas? Uh, we're going to have to step that up. I think that's quite clear. It goes without saying that, uh, you know, it needs acceleration. And um, I, I personally will never be satisfied unless the numbers really get inducted very fast. Yeah. And sir, the Tejas Mark II uh, iteration of this jet will be significantly uh, better in all respects. That's, that's right. Like I said, it's a development program which has given uh, genesis to the Mark II. Actually, the LCA Mark II will be the feeder technology for the AMCA, the AMCA. Most of the technologies that will develop and grow on the Mark II will be utilized on the AMCA. And sir, uh, let's talk about uh, India's stealth platform, the AMC. AMCA. Again, time is of essence since we, we've got stealth platforms in, in the region which are already operational. Um, in terms of the technology jump India will need to take, uh, are you confident we'll, we'll get there? Of course, we have full confidence in the uh, development capabilities of our nation. Uh, it's a very niche technology, uh, but I'm sure that the way the development programs are going on, we should be able to roll out the uh, prototypes at least of the AMCA on schedule and uh, what you have to keep in mind is that all the fifth generation fighters which are operational across the globe mm -hmm. have also taken equal or more amount of time to be operational from the time they were uh, you know uh, the first prototype was made so i think we've got very tight timelines and i'm confident that our uh, design and development and industry will be able to meet those timelines and why is it important for india to be inducting a stealth platform uh, globally now the shift towards um, stealth platforms, fifth generation platforms is uh, primarily due to the enhanced capability of the air defense systems, enhanced capability of the radars. So if you want to be unnoticed or you know you want to go in stealthily, then you need to have stealth. Yeah. So this is the technology which um, all the aircraft have to adopt yeah. in future. One of the key uh, areas where India would like to see a lot of improvement is uh, jet engine technology, the ability to manufacture state-of-the-art jet engines. Now we have uh, a deal in the works with General Electric that's for the engine of the Tejas. Uh, again, how important is it for this to actually result in these engines being built in India? Uh, 
uh, there's been a lot of talk over it, but we need to see it on the ground. Yes, so um, the agreement for the uh, F414 uh, in a six engine, it is uh, going to be custom made for the LCA Mark II. And the transfer of manufacturing technology to India will give rise to a whole new ecosystem for engine manufacturing and component manufacturing for the engines within our country. And uh, as we absorb these technologies and as the days go, I'm sure we will be um, you know, not too far away from building our own engine of the same potential. And it's an ecosystem which would be built. It, it's right. also job generation in a massive way. Yes. So it feeds a larger industry. Exactly. And a knowledge base, I would suggest. Very importantly, knowledge base, yes. And uh, Chief, what about a French engine for a larger platform? I know that the French, uh, the President of France is, is over here. Uh, they're also looking at opportunities in India. Is that something that interests India? I think, um, you know, the uh, Defence uh, Research and Development Organisation has to now collaborate with multiple partners and to be able to see what is best for, um, you know, developing, you know, trans absorbing the technology and developing our own engine. Air warfare has changed so much uh, in the last couple of years. We've seen what the conflict in Russia and Ukraine, uh, UCAVs, unmanned uh, aircraft, drones of various sizes and capabilities, and I dare say expenses, price points. Uh, are s redefining warfare. Um, how is this also a part of the thinking of the Indian Air Force? Like you mentioned, drones are now becoming a weapon of choice of both state as well as non-state actors. And we also realize the potential of, uh, you know, inducting drones in large numbers, not only for recce and surveillance, which were the traditional roles for which we use them, mm -hmm. but also for certain offensive missions. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, while the proliferation of drones takes place in the subcontinent, we have uh, a plan to boost up our air defense capabilities. Because now we have a huge um, spectrum of threats, starting from small drones to hypersonic weapons. Yes. So the air defense network and the air defense capabilities need to be strengthened in equal measure. We'll talk about uh, air, our air defense systems, the SAMs and all, in just a few moments. Uh, but let's talk a little bit more about drones. Um, are you satisfied at the pace at which developments are happening in India? Because there are private players also who are involved at various levels. The DRDO which is involved. There's the entire concept of, uh, of manned, unmanned teaming, which is in a sense the future. Could you tell us about some of the ideas you're looking at and technologies? Uh, you're aware that we had initiated a, a competition. We called it the Meher Baba competition back in 2017 astonishing results which came out from there, incubated many small uh, firms, many small industries who have started making drones in swarms and been able to meet the requirements that we had projected at that time. I think this uh, industry is really galloping within our country and most of it is in the private sector and small scale and we encourage all of them to come up with their ideas and see how we can implement them in our broader operational plans. On the other hand, uh, the uh, higher, um, you know, the, uh, the platforms which fly high and long endurance, we are um, collaborating with uh, various other industries to be able to um, plan out or chalk out a long-term plan to have our indigenous capability in this field. Yeah. So uh, the whole uh, drone ecosystem is being supported and encouraged by the armed forces and the FOs in particular. Yeah. So just to come back to what you were saying, um, our air defense network, um, before we talk about what we actually have in place, I, I would you agree that you know there's been a real engineering development at home. The fact that these technologies have been imbibed, the fact that we are not just replicating it, we are developing on these technologies. Uh, so there is a sound industrial and engineering base which has slowly been developed. So it's a, a certain knowledge curve which we have uh, arrived at. Uh, how is that important for the Air Force going forward? Uh, the primary role for the Air Force, as you are aware, is, for, is the air defense of the country. And uh, for which uh, one would like to have a, a, a huge plethora of um, air defense capabilities, ranging from counter U.S. systems mm -hmm. to the long-range weapons. So now uh, I'm happy to say that uh, most of the acquisitions that have been done in the last few years and that we have on the anvil in the next decade or so are all from indigenous sources yeah. and uh, I'm happy to say that we are more than, uh, more than satisfied with the performance 
and uh, we, we keep giving back uh, feedback to the industry as well as to the design authorities how to improve on the performance. Yeah, and so it's sensors also where we have reached a certain critical level. Uh, we've got ASA radars uh, deployed at various levels uh, with various systems. How is this uh, adding to the ability for you to actually get an integrated digital picture of the threats which we face across our airspace? So we have a very robust uh, network called the Integrated Air Command and Control System, which, um, which is being constantly upgraded. And the current version allows us to be able to actually carry out command and control from anywhere in the country on an air situation that arises anywhere else in the country. Right. So I am quite confident now that with the new version being rolled out and subsequent upgrades planned in the coming years, I think we will have a fairly robust capability in this aspect. We have also uh, improved greatly when it comes to surface to air missiles. Uh, the evolved uh, uh, Akash missile system, the NG variant of it, the MRSAM, the QRSAM, uh, they sort of give us the ability of, of tier defense, right? Just the missiles themselves uh, are now achieving ranges and capabilities which we have not seen in the past. Yeah. So this, uh, once again, the development is always um, countering the, the threats that are envisaged. So once you have aircraft that can release their weapons, their long-range weapons from more, the further distances than they were capable of in the past, then you need air defense systems which can counter these threats. Right. So as the development of air-to-surface missiles and weapons increases their range, we have to parallelly ensure that the surface-to-air weapons ranges outclasses these. Yeah. And sir, earlier on you alluded to the threat we face from, uh, from small drones. Uh, we already we already face that across the border. Um, how do we, how do we realistically counter the threat which we face, for example, on the Punjab front or parts of South Kashmir? There are two ways of countering it. One is uh, procedural control, and the other is through active measures. So, uh, while on one hand we need to permit drones to um, be utilized by the uh, you know for the by the farmers or by by anybody else who wants to use them. At the same hand, on the same hand, we have to uh, ensure that rogue elements do not have access to this and cannot, should not cause a nuisance. So uh, this is a procedural control that we have to uh, establish over who can fly drones in what area and so on. Yeah. And uh, if it is a rogue drone, then uh, we have inducted and we are in the process of inducting more and more counter US systems, right. both the soft kill as well as the hard kill versions. Right. Uh, Chief, we've also made a lot of progress uh, with the Astra missile system and the Brahmos missile system. I think one of the best aspects of the Astra besides the missile is it's our missile. We use it on our platforms. Uh, we use it exactly the way we want to. We don't have to, uh, you know, be dependent on any foreign manufacturers for the use of this weapon system on aircraft of a foreign origin. How important is that aspect for India? Absolutely essential to be able to be Atmanirbhar in such capabilities. No, beyond visual range missiles, the capability that it provides us today has given us a tremendous shot in the arm. And Chief, this is technology which is going to evolve over a period of time. Of course. Right? Of course. So the newer version will be even more capable and uh, it will be now uh, fitted, integrated on more number of platforms. Right. And sir, the Brahmos missile, we've seen it of course for the Navy, uh, more recently for the Air Force. Again, uh, a weapon system with tremendous potential, which gives you a lot of flexibility in operations. Exactly. It is one of our, uh, you know, the, the most capable weapons that we have in our arsenal today. And uh, with the NG version coming up in a few years from now, we are quite confident that it will meet the requirements of the Indian Air Force in the decades to come. One of the long-standing demands of the Indian Air Force, actually two demands, one of, uh, of uh, more refueling tankers uh, and secondly of more AWACS platforms. When you talk about AWACS platforms, we've reached again a critical mass in terms of, of the technology available in the country. Uh, given our, um, you know, the, the, the airspace that we need to control, how important is it for us to acquire more such systems? Force enablers, which are the AWACS and the tankers, definitely have, um, have to be acquired in the right number at the right time mm -hmm. to give, uh, you know, to ensure that our capability is not degraded. When it comes to the AVAX, uh, the AWC Netra, yeah. we have inducted three of them. We have plans to induct six more of the same version. And we had procured six uh, used Airbus 321 platforms from Air India. 
So we'll be converting those also into the AWC, which we call it the Mark II version. Yeah. And uh, so this will give us adequate capability, uh, you know, in terms of the AWC portion in for the next two or few decades. Yeah. When it comes to the tankers, the air-to-air -air refueling, we are uh, in the process of acquiring one tanker on lease right now, and a case for six additional tankers is being processed. Yeah. So it's been processed for a long period of time. Are you confident that we'll see progress? Why is it important for us to have tankers? Uh, just for, again the, for a the, the reach of aircraft is enhanced tremendously. The disadvantage of flying from high altitude airfields can be nullified by flying at from airfields which are in the hinterland and at lower altitudes. So the, they can carry more weapons operating from lower altitudes. I mean the list is endless. Uh, right. right. Yeah. So. Yeah. so uh, what more than 25, 26 years back when I was a cub reporter, I started reporting MRCA. That became MMRCA. Then finally we got 36 Rafale jets. Now there's this 114 aircraft process. That has also gone on for what seems like 114 years. Uh, are you optimistic of a breakthrough soon? Yeah, you know, we have to, uh, the, uh, we have been following all the procedures to the T. And uh, as per the Defense Acquisition Procedure 2020, so we are hopeful that uh, we will reach mm -hmm. some finality shortly. We are seeing evolving air power in Pakistan and in China. Let's talk about Pakistan first. They've acquired several new platforms. The J-10 platform, uh, is, uh, they, they have been, the JF-17 Thunder, they are acquiring in large numbers, already have. Uh, they have upgraded F-16s as well. Uh, what sort of threat does this represent to us? Uh, how do we need to be alive to the threat, firstly, of Pakistan? Uh, See, we are cognizant of the capabilities and their uh, the development that is taking place across the borders. And our own capability development plan, keeping this in mind, has got, we've, we've chalked out a roadmap for not only acquisitions, but also upgradations of the existing platforms, design and development of newer weapon systems that can be fitted on the existing platforms, and so on. So... Um, we follow what they call the, the ABCD model, A is to acquire newer technologies and new platforms, B is to boost the capabilities of the existing platforms, C is to conserve the old and potent platforms that we still have, mm -hmm. and D is to design and develop new ones. Yeah. And so, um, you know, China obviously a concern at so many levels. There's also a great deal of airfield modernization on their side. Um, and the, the, the willingness to deploy assets uh, along the front line, as it were. Uh, I assume this is something the Air Force monitors. Any thoughts on the threat we face, both from airfields, modernization across the front, and the platforms they're inducting? Once again, uh, we, we keep a close eye on uh, the developments that are occurring there, not only in the infrastructure development, but also in the aircraft and the capabilities that they possess. And uh, let me assure you that our own capability development plan, which pans out for the next two decades or so, will uh, adequately be able to counter any such uh, development that takes place. Yeah. And one final question, sir. Uh, the Air Force, I would suggest, more than any other service among the armed forces, has championed the cause of women. You've got excellent women fighter pilots at all levels and so on. How is this a key part of now the identity of the Indian Air Force to induct women at all levels? I, I think the, um, the message is loud and clear that being... Um, you know, gender agnostic service, having given equal opportunities for women to take part in every activity, to undergo every possible course, to tenant every possible appointment. I think it's, in, uh, it's not just symbolic, it, is, uh, it gives adequate confidence in their capabilities and I'm sure it will encourage more women to join the Indian Air Force. Chief, it's always wonderful speaking to you. Thank you very much indeed. The Chief of Air Staff there talking uh, extensively about uh, the nature of the challenges that the Indian Air Force faces, uh, the addition of a whole host of capabilities for the Indian Air Force and how we are entirely alive to the situation and the evolving nature of warfare around the world.